Ah, Father, thank you for coming so quickly. Uh, it's downstairs. Uh, I'm happy to do what I can, but I must warn you, these types of rituals are very uncommon. Even when the movies came out, these weren't really done much anymore. Oh, so you've, uh, seen the film? Once or twice. Uh, that's good. It'll, uh, make this a lot easier to explain. Oh, my. Okay, Professor. Joke's over and... Oh my god, you actually got a priest. What a... What on earth is going on in here? Whatever this is, I will have no part in it. Untie this man this instant! Hold on a minute, Father. Allow me to explain. Michael, would you please tell the priest what your opinion is regarding the Exorcist movie and the novel that it was based on? What? I just said that I like the movie better than the source material. <sighs> huh. Sanctus Stercori. Oh, God, not him, too. Uh, okay, listen, you two, there is nothing wrong with liking the movie better than the source material. Sometimes the adaptation is better. Hence why I think he's possessed. Why do you say that? He's a book reviewer. Oh, my, this is a, oh, this is a, a rather serious case. I'll see what I can do. Okay, listen, before we do anything rash, why don't you just let me go over there and explain my reasoning? I'll do a review, and then you can decide for yourselves whether or not I'm possessed or not, but at least I'll have been able to say my piece. Sound good? Sounds fair to me. Ah, <sighs> finally some reason. Okay, can one of you untie me? I'm, uh, not entirely comfortable with that, you know, uh, just in case you are possessed. <sighs> Fine, I'll have Iota teleport me to the desk and put a force field around me. <gasps> Reinforced with holy water. Iota, energize. Energizing. <sighs> okay, let's get down to business. Hello and welcome to the literary lair. Let me get this out of the way now. I prefer the Exorcist film to the original novel, and that's not a bad thing, despite what some people apparently think. I've gone at length before about how adaptations can be better than the source material that they were based on. Hell, I did an entire list about adaptations that changed the source material and came out better for it. And The Exorcist is no different, though it does have one notable advantage over several other adaptations. The novel and the screenplay were both written by William Peter Blatty, so any changes were entirely sanctioned by Blatty himself, and I can't imagine that he'd have made any changes that he fundamentally disagreed with that ruined the original novel. Like many of you, I was aware of the film prior to reading the original novel, so like Jurassic Park and Planet of the Apes, I sort of already had an idea of what it was going to be like going in, and I had my own preconceptions. In fact, I read this for an adaptation class last semester, reading most of it prior to seeing the extended director's cut of the film, and as much as I enjoyed the book, I enjoyed the movie more. And that apparently means I'm possessed by a demon, so now I have to show my work on that opinion. But before we start, let's get some backstory on The Exorcist. It was released in 1971 by William Peter Blatty and was inspired by a real-life case of demonic possession that Blatty studied while at Georgetown 20 years previously, with the names and such being changed for the purposes of telling a coherent story, the possessed child in reality not being a young girl named Reagan, but a young boy named 
named Roland. And, of course, it was adapted into a 1973 film of the same name, starring Linda Blair and Ellen Burstyn. Now, typically, I don't really worry about which edition I use for a review, because most of the time, the changes are pretty negligible. But for this one, I went to the trouble of specifically getting the 40th anniversary edition. Why? Well, because of this quote from Blatty himself. The 40th anniversary edition of The Exorcist will have a touch of new material in it as part of an all-around polish of the dialogue and prose. First time around, I never had the time, meaning the funds, to do a second draft, and this, finally, is it. With 40 years to think about it, a few little changes were inevitable, plus one new character in a totally new, very spooky scene. This is the version I would like to be remembered for. And who am I to deny him that wish? So let's get straight into it. This is The Exorcist. I'm going to use the 40th Anniversary Editions cover mainly because it's the first cover that I was exposed to regarding the book. Also, I really like it. Minimalist, but not too bland or boring. We've got a little girl, presumably Reagan, tinted red in the background surrounded by a black void. And the title across her face, along with the author a little bit reminding us that this is a novel, and the 40th anniversary tagline at the top. Not too busy, not too sparse, but just right and unnerving enough to set the mood before you even open the book up. It's a great cover, but let's get on to the story itself. The book opens at an archaeological dig where Father Marin is unnerved by something they dig up, sensing a great evil. We then pivot to Chris McNeil, an actress living in Georgetown with her daughter Reagan, as they finish up location shooting for her newest movie. She also has aspirations to direct one day, and her agent managed to get her a small segment in an anthology. Unfortunately, that anthology was movie 43, so... However, strange things start to happen in her rental house, hearing strange noises, items going missing, only to turn up in places she already looked, the usual horror tropes. She at first suspects the German housekeepers, Carl and Willie, but they deny having anything to do with it. Wait a minute, a German named Carl? Where have I heard that before? Chris takes notice, however, when Reagan starts acting strange, and since her previous child had passed away young, she has a mistrust of doctors and medical settings. The only strange thing that Reagan had done before her behavior radically changed was that she found a Ouija board in the basement and had been communicating with an imaginary friend, Captain Howdy, although little notice is taken to that at the time. Meanwhile, Father Damien Karras is having a rough go of it. Not only is he having trouble finding his vocation, having a desire to step away from the priesthood, but his mother is sick and is living in squalor in New York while he's all the way down in Georgetown, so he's far away from her when she needs him. This is compounded when she passes away, and he finds out that because he was all she had, her body wasn't found for several days. Reagan's behavior gets worse, with her ruining a dinner party thrown by Chris by peeing all over the carpet, like Jenny in the first Fudge book, but instead of being played for laughs, it leads to Chris really trying to get to the bottom of it. The only problem is doctors can't find anything medically wrong with her, despite how many procedures they do, and they think that she's either faking it, or it's psychological. Psychological. Chris has a fundamental mistrust of doctors and medicine due to the aforementioned losing her child to an infection, so the entire ordeal is a lot for her. A friend of hers, a so-called psychic, gives her a book on paranormal phenomenon that she thinks might help, but it goes missing shortly after Chris receives it. 
Chris initially thinks that the behavioral shift might have had something to do with her recent divorce with Reagan's father, but that mode of thinking doesn't really go anywhere. Eventually, Chris starts to think that it might be demonic possession, since the Ouija board and everything was where this all started, and starts to look into the possibility, trying to find out more from a local priest, Father Dyer, a friend of Karis's. But that's ridiculous! Ouija boards causing demonic possession is a different horror movie. Things are compounded when Burke Dennings, the director for Chris's movie, comes over to visit while Chris is out meeting with the doctor, and Sharon, Chris's assistant, leaves Burke in charge of Reagan while she dips out to get Reagan's prescription filled. While they're alone, Burke, a known drunk, takes a tumble down the M Street steps near the house and dies. Though Chris knows that the only way that he could have possibly done that would be if he fell out of Reagan's window. But how did that happen? Because of this, Lieutenant Kinderman starts snooping around, trying to solve the mystery, while Chris desperately tries to figure out what's wrong with her daughter, and Karis works through his crises of faith, including that new scene where the new character, where Karis dreams of a Father Lucas who warns him to stay far away from the McNeils. Over the course of the novel, Reagan gets worse looking and acting, and Kinderman starts to drain the suspect pool. He initially suspects Carl, because Burke was kind of a douchebag and harassed Carl mercilessly with not seeing German jokes, so he had motive, though really anyone who had ever met Burke had motive, and he has a checkered past involving theft. A German named Carl with a checkered past? I swear this seems really familiar. But Carl is proven innocent when it's revealed that his alibi not adding up was because he's keeping a secret from Willie. Not an affair, but their daughter, a drug addict who refuses to seek treatment, and Carl had been visiting her in secret while telling Willie that she was dead to spare her feelings. Eventually, Kinderman starts to suspect someone else, but the only logical suspect is an 11-year-old girl who was basically in a coma, which is just silly. Chris goes to Karis, who agrees to see Reagan as a psychiatric patient. Oh, yeah, Karis is a priest and a psychiatrist, but even he can't deny the obvious stuff, like Reagan having a completely alternate personality than she did before, knowing words and things that she couldn't have any knowledge of, and after conducting all the scientific tests, he concludes that Chris might be on to something, and agrees to petition for an exorcism. The bishop agrees, but he doesn't think that Karis is qualified enough and calls in a senior priest, Father Marin, who has experience with exorcisms. Marin is aware that he was going to be called and arrives quickly, with the two priests doing their best to find out the demon's intentions. The exorcism is brutal and taxing on both their physical and mental states. Marin even knows the demon, named Pazuzu. Not that one, having fought it before, which is why he could sense Pazuzu's evil at the dig site. In the end, Marin dies of a heart attack, which he had been taking medication for, and Karis is forced to finish the exorcism solo. The demon taunts Karis with images of his mother, and Karis, fed up, orders the demon to instead possess him and spare Reagan. After that, he rushes to the window and throws it open, using the last vestige of his controlling humanity to leap out onto the M Street steps, dying the same way that Burke did, though Dyer hears the commotion and gives Karis his last rites before Karis slips off the mortal coil. Following the chaos, Chris and Reagan, who seemingly suffers no ill effects of the possession and, in fact, cannot remember any of her actions during it, leave, heading back to California with Willie and Carl, saying goodbye to Father Dyer as they pack their possessions and go. After they depart, Kinderman arrives, hoping to say goodbye to Chris, but Dyer tells him that they've left. The novel ends with Kinderman and Dyer agreeing to see a film together, as they try to forget the chaos that engulfed their lives the last few months. The characters in this novel are great. Every single one is developed and unique. Blatty is a fantastic writer, and this book is no exception. Chris McNeil is a brilliant protagonist. At least I consider her the main protagonist, as she, apart from Reagan, is the center of the book. Everything happens in her home. She interacts with every major character at least once. There's a lot of good stuff from her. Her love of her daughter, her complicated relationships, especially her ex-husband, 
husband and watching her fall apart as her daughter is corrupted by Pazuzu is incredibly powerful. Sad and powerful as you think about for her. This is like losing her first child all over again, but it's drawn out and she has no idea what's wrong with Reagan. No medical answer, no scientific answer, just a daughter turned demon who doesn't really know her. And I love the fact that she does get her happy ending. She gets her daughter back despite all the death and destruction that preceded it. Father Karras is probably my favorite character. He's such a departure from what I usually think of a priest being, especially his exchange with that homeless man where he legitimately doesn't want to have to do his heavenly duties because he's worried about his mother. There also might be some solidarity in there since he is a New Yorker. His story with his mother is also touching and really informs on the way he acts. I also like how diligently he is with the scientific and medical explanations. A lot of fictional priests will just jump to demons and the like, but Blatty wrote Karis to be level-headed. In fact, most of the priests are level-headed. It's Chris who demands the exorcism out of Karis. He never really wanted to do it. And it makes sense that his final act would be to save an innocent girl and get rid of a great evil. Plus, the way that he, for the most of the novel, was sort of a neurotic mess was really endearing, and I was invested in his story of him refinding his vocation and ultimately being the hero of the story. Reagan, well, it's hard to analyze her because we only really know her at the very beginning and the very end. She definitely didn't deserve what happened to her and seemed like a wonderful person and a good daughter, the antithesis of what the demon nearly turned her into. Speaking of Pazuzu, having the demon not truly reveal itself until relatively far into the novel was brilliant, because there's a good sense of suspense in not knowing what the demon is or what it wants, especially when it seems as if Reagan is the one talking before it becomes clear that its possession. And it was a fine antagonist because of the uncertainty of it being a demon and the limits of its powers. Kinderman is a neat character, if only because he seems like the sane man in an insane world. And he shows humanity when he makes a very strong suggestion to Carl's daughter that she seek treatment or else. Which, while wrong, is at least ultimately from a place of goodness, since he has a kid as well and likely did it because he felt for Carl. And the fact that he very correctly figures out that it was Ray Reagan early on and never tells anyone because it doesn't make any sense so there must have been more to it, is brilliant. And to his credit, he doesn't immediately barge into the McNeil house and demand to see the girl like a crappily written detective would. He's a competent detective. He does everything right and is probably one of the best characters in the book, even if he was a little preoccupied with the pictures. Say, anyone tell you that you kind of look like Humphrey Bogart? Carl was interesting too. Willie was just sort of there, but Carl was a huge focus of the Kinderman plot, and his entire deal with the daughter was very touching and heartbreaking at the same time, especially when the demon taunted him and tried to tell Willie about their daughter's true fate. And hell, maybe I found Carl so interesting because he reminds me of... some character from a web series about, uh... remaking popular movies, but worse, played by... Someone very close to the main actor slash writer of the series who appeared in several of his other works across his website, including the main review series and- Oh! Of course! How could I have been so forgetful? He reminds me of Admiral Crackers from Brad Jones' demo reel one-shot. RELEASE THE CRACKERS! I can't really feel bad for Burke Dennings because, well, he was kind of an asshat. I mean, he didn't deserve to die, but- still. But I do feel bad for Father Marin, who ultimately loses his battle with the demon and succumbs to heart disease. I also feel bad for Father Dyer, because he seemed to be really good friends with Karis, and losing him must have been really hard. I also liked Sharon Spencer, especially because she stuck around during the really crazy stuff when no one would have judged her from getting as far away as possible, because she clearly cared about Reagan. The thing about the story, and it's not even really the book's fault, it's more of pop culture's fault, like Planet of the Apes, because of the film. I knew going in what to expect, a horror novel, but it wasn't really scary. It was a tad unsettling, but my first time reading it, I wasn't really scared at all. 
and I also found it really slow during my first read-through before seeing the movie. I said I never finished it before seeing the movie because it was slow and I got bored. There's just so much back and forth and not a lot with the actual exorcism stuff, so I ended up enjoying the movie more because it was paced more like the horror material I was expecting, and it was able to jump scare me back into paying attention if my mind drifted. And there's a reason for that. The book wasn't really intended to be a horror novel. And if you think I'm full of it, listen to this quote from William Peter Blatty himself. When I was writing the novel, I thought I was writing a supernatural detective story that was filled with suspense and theological overtones. To this day, I have zero recollection of even a moment when I was writing that I was trying to frighten anyone. And that it is, a supernatural detective story solving the mystery of what's going on with Reagan McNeil. In the novel, Kinderman is more of the main focus, considering that he closes out the novel and speaks with nearly every major character at least once. Because that's what it is, a detective story, and it's a damn good one. Just not what I expected from it, and so I like the movie a little better. But I will admit that upon a second read-through, I definitely think that the pacing isn't quite as slow and boring as I thought it was the first time around. Maybe it was because I was reading it for a class, so I was in a time crunch and my brain was sabotaging me by making it a chore rather than the experience that my second read-through was. They were legitimately edge-of-my-seat moments, even though they were mainly clustered near the end during the exercise. Exorcism. The Exorcist is a brilliant horror novel with an even more brilliant adaptation. While the book is phenomenal, the movie had a lot of things going for it. It was a pioneer in its genre. Basically every horror movie trope that's been done to death was done in The Exorcist first, or it was among the first to use them. The actors are wonderful, and the definitive versions of these characters, the directing, the cinematography, the music, everything just fell together, plus the condensation of the story to make it more more palatable for a screenplay, just enhanced everything wonderful about the book. I like the movie better, because like Jurassic Park, it took every good thing that the book had and enhanced it. I still love this book to death, and after my second reading, having seen the movie in its entirety, I definitely like the book and movie more equally. But the movie still wins out for me, ever so slightly. But overall, I do recommend the book because it's great, and if you haven't read it but have seen the movie, trust me, it's an experience equal to the film. And if you've read it and haven't seen the movie, what the hell are you doing with your life? Regardless, the book is awesome, and it definitely makes me want to check out Legion to see where the story of Karis and Kinderman go from here. Though, if you are going to read the book, I definitely think you should give it two goes before you form your opinion. I learned doing this that my first opinion was slightly flawed. In the meantime, if you like this video, you can subscribe and watch one of my other videos, and if you have any comments or complaints about the video, you can put those in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video, show it to your friends and share it around the internet. And maybe consider supporting the show on Patreon. See you next time. Oh, oh yeah, uh, force field. So, what's the verdict? Um, well, you, uh, you, you made your point in a very fair and balanced way. And you laid out your reasoning very logically. I can understand your platform completely. So, do you finally believe I'm not possessed? Well, yes, I'm... I'm sorry I doubted you, but, uh, you must admit it's a bit of a strange opinion. Maybe so, but no more crazy than any other internet personality. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got to get back to the rectory. The other priests are meeting up to go see the nun. For purely educational purposes, we're deciding whether or not the church should denounce it. All right, have a good night, Father. Sorry that we dragged you all the way out here. No problem at all. May God bless you both. <laughs> you didn't tell him I was agnostic, did you? It, uh, it never came up. <laughs> Listen, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about all this. I, I guess I sort of overreacted. You're just looking out for me. I get it. Mike Sano probably would have done the same thing. Although, knowing him, he probably would have tried to do the exorcism himself.
Well, uh, I'm pooped. Good night, Mike. Night, Professor. Ha, 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 ha.